So in our previous video, we established um, a recessively inherited disorder known as sickle cell disease. This next flowchart will be a conclusion to recessively inherited disorders, and we'll entitle it Recessively Inherited Disorders Roman Numeral 3, since it's our third flowchart. And let's remind ourselves what we are talking about. We are talking about different types. In our previous video, we established cystic fibrosis and also sickle cell disease. This is a continuation of understanding sickle cell disease. We already established how it happens, why it happens, what's normal and what's abnormal. Now what we want to do is look at some very critical and very interesting genetic results of this very interesting disease. The big idea behind sickle cell disease that's always sort of looked at is looking at the heterozygotes of sickle cell disease. So they have a very, very interesting scenario and it goes like this. If we have the idea of heterozygotes in sickle cell disease, we have to understand that heterozygotes actually display something known as codominance, meaning that the normal plus the abnormal alleles, okay, so let's say the dominant plus the recessive alleles, in other words, okay, normal plus abnormal alleles are what we consider codominant. So I'll just say codominant. What does that mean? Well, that means that anybody who's a heterozygote will actually express both normal and abnormal red blood cells. They will have some, let's say, normal hemoglobin. So they'll have some normal Hb for hemoglobin, but they'll also have some abnormal. Okay, so this is actually the first time we're seeing codominance, I believe, in this course. Some normal hemoglobin, some abnormal hemoglobin. This would mean that they have some normal red blood cells because hemoglobin is a part of red blood cells. So we'll say some normal RBCs. And then they'll also have some abnormal RBCs. You get the picture. So what does that mean? What is the overall implication of having some normal, sub, some abnormal? And let's remember these abnormal ones are known as the sickle cells, right? Let me rewrite that. These are known as the sickle cells because they are the crescent-shaped. What is the genetic implication? Well, the implication is that we get a very interesting mixture of alleles. We get a mixture of normal and abnormal. Now this mixture is critical because this mixture of normal red blood cells and sickle red blood cells actually gives us the ability, gives people who are heterozygous the ability to be resistant to an, an even more, I would say, catastrophic disease known as malaria. Malaria, in very basic, simple terms, is simply a red blood cell parasite. It's a parasite that mosquitoes house that get into our own blood and they want to get into red blood cells very, very badly. This parasite that's within malaria um, has this need to be in red blood cells, but that red blood cell has to be normal, okay? Normal red blood cells. That's its sort of prerequisite. It has to be um, within a normal red blood cell to go about its normal uh, parasitic lifespan. But what happens if you have a sickle red blood cell? Well, in this situation, malaria actually can't work. Malaria, let's say, can't work, for lack of a better phrase, in what we called sickle red blood cells because the environment does not promote malarial, let's say, replication, parasitic replication. The parasite is all out of whack. He sees this sickle red blood cell, he doesn't know what to do, and he just has a very bad job, very bad time of promoting itself in this parasitic life cycle. So even though a sickle cell individual who's a heterozygote has some normal and some abnormal this mixture actually prevents them from being subjected to a very devastating disease known as malaria. So this is really, really cool to me to think that even though you have some problematic regions within your genotype and thus your phenotype, that is actually going to be critical in protecting you from an external disease, from a non-genetic disease like malaria, which is absolutely crazy to me. And this is crazier to me because 
we have to look at something known as the evolutionary significance of such a weird sort of first time mixture result that we've seen. What is the evolutionary implication of such a result? So before I get into the evolutionary implication, let's understand one thing. If we talked about heterozygotes, we've got to talk about the homozygous people. What if we have a homozygous dominant individual? What would you say about their red blood cells? They would be all normal. So I just want to establish this before I go into the evolution. So all normal RBC. And what if we have a homo recessive individual? They would be all abnormal. RBC. So I just want to make sure we understand that. And of course, if you have somebody who has one allele that's dominant and one allele that's recessive, aka normal plus abnormal, you have a mixture. So what is the evolutionary implication? In evolution, we call this, and in population genetics, we call this something known as the heterozygote advantage. This is a very interesting idea, that the heterozygote has an evolutionary advantage, but specifically, you have to make sure you understand where the advantage is. This heterozygote advantage runs very clear in what we call an endemic, and endemic simply means common, let's say, for an, another word, better scientific word would be endemic, um, malaria populations. So think about it. Where do you see malaria most often? On the map, in the world. That's usually in sub-Saharan African populations. And so, if you have a heterozygous individual in that population, they are at a distinct advantage, evolutionarily speaking, because of the following. If they happen to be homozygous dominant, do they have any resistance whatsoever to malaria? No, because every single one of their red blood cells is normal, all normal red blood cells. What does malaria need? It needs normal red blood cells. The malaria goes to town on people that are homozygous dominant because there is absolutely no way for these red blood cells to cause um, any sort of problem for them. This, so this would mean that you have no resistance. Just want to rewrite that. No resistance, and what actually happens is people who have the homozygous dominant trait, they actually die from malaria, okay? Die from malaria, not because they are normal in terms of their sickle cell or uh, red blood cells, but because of malaria. So called malaria causes them to die. What about homozygous recessive individuals? Well, these individuals, Though they have resistance, they certainly do because malaria, what does it need? Malaria needs normal red blood cells. So we have resistance, but I want to say that you have to understand that these people are anemic. They're living a poor uh, lifestyle. They are living a poor life because of this anemia that runs rampant in them. Go back to the previous video and look at all the problems associated with somebody who has this full-fledged sickle cell disease. And finally, if you have a heterozygous individual, these people have a mixture. Okay, This is the key idea, have mixture. They display co-dominance. This gives them a distinct advantage, a super advantage within the population. Remember, this is within a malaria population. That's usually sub-Saharan Africa, right? And thus, these people, you can consider them the most prosperous, the most successful, the most fit. All terms that we're going to be getting to when we talk about um, evolution a little bit later on in this uh, lecture, in this uh subject of biology 115. So this is our idea behind sickle cell disease. I find this fascinating. The idea that heterozygotes are at this distinct advantage so long as we're looking at endemic malaria populations. These are the following results from that conclusion. Very cool stuff. I love this genetic stuff. Love this evolutionary implication. Hopefully you have a better understanding and a better appreciation of course for the complexity of something like sickle cell disease.